your songbook, everyone. We'll sing together. 435, please. 435. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. Since Jesus came into my heart, let's stand together. 435. Oh, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. Since Jesus came into my heart. together. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. singing this morning. Brother Bob is out of town this weekend, a well-deserved weekend away with his beautiful wife, and uh, they're having a good time. It's kind of a late birthday getaway for them, so we're glad they could do that. Amen. And uh, but I, got, I get to lead singing today. Amen. And, uh, it's been a while since I led the singing and did the announcement and did the preaching and did the choir, and uh, uh, I won't be here tonight, but no. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it's good to see you here today. Good singing today. And uh, thank you for being in church this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for another Lord's Day that you've given to us. And Father, we're, we are thankful this morning for the wonderful day that Jesus Christ came into our heart. Yes. Never been the same since. And Lord, I pray this morning, if any in the room have never asked Christ to be their Savior, that today would be the day that they would invite him in to save them and to change their life forever and I know that he would and he will may you be pleased with our service here this morning bless the music bless our fellowship together may Christ be lifted up and may you draw all of us closer to him because we were here together this morning we pray this in Jesus precious name amen all right you may be seated
All right, take your songbook. We'll all sing together again. Number five, zero, please. Number 50, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Oh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. There's wonderful power in the Together, oh, would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you the name in his praise as you sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. On the land, there is power. singing this morning. Now we have a few announcements for you. Uh, listen carefully if you would. There's no 530 Christian growth class this evening. We'll re begin that again uh, right after the turkey dinner Sunday, which is next Sunday. So we'll resume on the 22nd uh, of November with those classes. Uh, but we'll have the evening service here tonight at 630. And uh, I will have the, uh, all the assignments up by this evening. And I uh, didn't quite get it finished uh, for today. But we'll get it done this afternoon and have it up so you know what you're doing next Sunday. Now, uh, some reminders about next Sunday, okay? Next Sunday, there's no 9.30. It's all 10.30 for the service, and there'll be uh, uh, <laughs> come early anyway, all right? And uh, help us uh, with folks who will be coming in, get them to the right places, and uh, help them find a seat here in the auditorium. And uh, remember, if you signed up to do the, one of the turkeys, we'll have them here Wednesday night. Uh, they'll be in the fellowship hall, and uh, paper will be there as well. When you pick your turkey up, you'll get your turkey, a pan to cook it in if you need it, uh, two small pans that uh, you'll take. They're called half pans, I believe. And you will, once you cook your turkey, you'll put the dark meat in one and the white meat in the other. And bring it in warm, if possible, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, they will take it in the kitchen and take it from there. And, uh, but when you pick it up Wednesday night, just cross your name off the list. That way we know who has theirs and uh, who needs to get theirs yet, okay? And uh, that'll help us. Your cans of vegetables can be left in the kitchen. Several of you have already brought those in. We appreciate that. And you can cross your name on the list. It's right on the refrigerator in the kitchen. And then uh, let's continue to get the flyers out. We're at 12,200 that got out this last week. And so that's a good start. 7,800 to go. And uh, we've got uh, about six days to get it done, all right? So uh, let's keep at it, and uh, let's, let's go get them, all right? And uh, invite folks to come be part of the service. By the way, I can also add uh, anything, any social media you're involved in, uh, go ahead and advertise it, uh, get the word out, spread the word. We'll have ads on Craigslist this, this week. Every year we have people come because of Craigslist. And um, I mean Newark, Pataskula, Westerville, they come from all over. Uh, if they see the word free, they're in. Uh, so, and by the way, that's okay. It's one of my favorite words too, all right? So uh, we'll have a great, great time together uh, next Sunday, okay? Then um, don't forget Saturday, uh, we will have our work day right here, 9 o'clock for a rally right here in the auditorium and uh, uh, some instructions about what we're going to be doing um, and then some prayer time and then we'll get at it, setting up the different children's churches, cleaning, uh, getting everything ready for Sunday, okay? That'll be Saturday morning at 9 a.m. sharp uh, to be here and uh, let's have a good crowd out to be able to get things ready. If there's a, many hands, we'll make light work, 
okay? And uh, But usually we get all that. If enough people are here, we have it all wrapped up by about noon or so. And uh, you can be on your way for the rest of the day. So uh, make sure you're here for that rally, 9 o'clock Saturday morning. Next Sunday, now, there won't be parking back behind the building. We'll park uh, on that side of Kirk Williams. Or we'll park over here in this uh, strip mall over here, okay, in the back. That's where you'll park. If you, need, if you need to come in, come in here, and we can have someone go park your car. If that's too far to walk, some of you are... Uh, that's a that's a long walk for you. We'll have some gentlemen that'll park your car for you, and then if you're real nice, they'll bring your keys back to you. All right, and uh, we'll we'll provide parking for you next Sunday. Okay, all right. I think that's all I have right now. So let's take just a moment, and we'll see if anybody's visiting with us today in the service. We're always pleased when people visit. Anybody here this morning for the first time? Looking around to see any first timers. I think everybody's. Uh, we got, well, you're right, first time in church, isn't it, Callie? All right. Callie, go ahead and introduce yourself and your daughter. Would you do that? Good. Casey and Callie. Good to have both of you. That's great. They've been in Sunday school for a couple of weeks. It's the first time they've been in church. And uh, thank you for being there, ladies. They'll hand you that welcome card. If you'll take just a moment and fill that out, we'd appreciate it. And a little bit when we have the offering, just drop that card in the plate. And keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. All right, we're glad you're here today. That's good. All right, let's give them a warm welcome, shall we?
everybody take your songbook. We'll sing another song together. 340, 340, 340. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. Verily, verily. On the first stanza together. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son saith he hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. My iniquities on him were laid. All my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, the Lord hath said, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son is true, hath everlasting life. On the last, though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. He that believeth on the good news shout, hath everlasting life. Sing it. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, message ever new, he that believeth on the Son is true, hath everlasting life. And if you will, over to 294, back a few pages to the left, 294. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. No other plea, 294. Let's stand together to sing it, shall we? All of us standing, 294. When we sing this, the children can go out and go to children's church, all right? My faith has found, ready? My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. Wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves and doubt. I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. The instruments will play that through a few times. You greet each other this morning, especially our guests, and we'll come back and sing the third and fourth.
need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Stanza number three. Sing it together. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. Blood he shed for me, his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Great singing. You may be seated. The ushers will come and get our offering this morning. By the way, there are flyers in the conference room on the table there and the clipboard to sign them out, okay? So uh, you can grab some and get some out this week. That'll be wonderful. And uh, you can do that today, all right? Let's uh, pray. We'll ask God's blessing uh, on the offering this morning. Brother Abrams, I you lead us in our prayer. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful day to worship you. We ask your blessing on the pastor as he brings your word. You bless uh, each gift and each giver, and uh, let us all be joyful givers. And uh, we thank you for your tender mercies, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to read the first seven verses. First seven verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We read them responsibly as we begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2 and alternate through 3 together until we end together on verse number 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse number 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, ready? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you. And peace from God our Father 
and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, that we'd be ready to receive the truth from your word today. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit here this morning. Thank you for the wonderful singing of these in attendance. And God, I pray that you would bless the special now to continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth you have for us this morning. So, Lord, help us to be quiet, help us to be still, and to know that you are God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, our Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for being the God who can help us, the God who desires to encourage us. You're the God of all comfort, the God of all consolation. Lord, thank you for what we've already heard today. Thank you for the good fellowship here this morning and the good music and the ability to give back to you a portion of what you give to us. And now, Lord, I pray you'll open our understanding and open our hearts to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Thank you for giving us the Bible. Thank you that we have copies of it today in our hands. Lord, we do not just believe it to be the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be in truth, the Word of God. And I believe it will work effectually in each one of us who believe. And so, Lord, help us to listen today and mix what we hear with faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please you. May your will be accomplished in each one of our lives this morning. Use the word and use the message today to that end, please. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. A man saw another man standing on a bridge about to jump. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. Nothing can be that bad. And the fellow looked at him and said, oh yeah. And he began to tell him about his problems. How his, he lost his job. His investment broker just went to jail with all his money. My wife left me for another man. I wrecked my car. My house burnt down. And on and on he went about his troubles for about 30 minutes. And at the end of 30 minutes, they both jumped off the bridge. <laughs> you know, nobody ever wants to hear the words, I give up. Nobody ever, those are, those are fatal words. When the preacher says it, the ministry's over. When the parent says it, the home is over. When a spouse says it, the marriage is over. When people say it, their life is over. They all have one thing in common when they come to the point of saying, I give up. And that is discouragement. Discouragement. Everybody needs encouragement. Nobody can say, I never need to be encouraged. I was reading this week about a faithful pastor who was told by his superior that something was wrong with his church. He said, you have only had one person added to your church this year, and that was a little boy. Later that day, heavy of heart, the pastor was praying and pouring his heart out to God when somebody came up behind him. <clears throat> Turning around, he saw that same little boy, his only convert for that year. The boy said, Pastor, do you think I could become a preacher or a missionary or something like that? The pastor encouraged him to pray and to seek God about it. That little boy was someone named Robert Moffat. He wasn't big. They called him Wee Bobby Moffat. But he became the first missionary to the continent of Africa. And years later, when Moffat spoke in London, a young doctor heard him say, I've seen the morning sun, in the morning sun, the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been. And the young doctor, deeply moved by Moffat's message, was none other than David Livingston, who then went to Africa, where he labored for Jesus for more than 30 years. And all of that happened. Because a faithful pastor encouraged one little boy to seek God's will about being a missionary or being a preacher. Listen, greatness is not determined by your talent. Greatness is not determined by your personality. Greatness is not determined by your wealth or your ancestry. Greatness is determined by what it takes to stop you. Greatness is determined by what it takes to discourage you. 
I love the story of the little fellow who, how many of you fellows in here, maybe, maybe girls, used to, um, we kind of lived in the country growing up, and we had a gravel driveway, and we had the little stones there, and I used to pick those little stones up with a wiffle ball bat, hit those stones. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, quite a few people did. And this little fellow, sometimes you just throw the ball up and, you know, hit the, uh, throw it up like this and then hit the ball. And uh, this little boy went out and he was just learning how to do it, you know, and, and he picked the ball up and he threw it up in the air and he swung and he missed. He shook his head and he picked the ball up and he threw it up just a little bit higher so he'd have a little more time to, to get his swing. And he got his arm and he swung and he missed it again. Got discouraged, but he picked it up and he threw it up the third time. Threw it up a little higher this time. And he's waiting for that ball to come down. And he swung with all his might and he missed it the third time. But he reached down, picked the ball up, and he said, man, what a pitcher. <laughs> That's encouragement. What does it take to discourage you? What does it take to stop you? You see, I'm talking to people this morning who fall into the used to category. You used to go to church faithfully, but not anymore. You used to maybe work on a bus route, but not anymore. You used to tithe and give faithfully to the Lord's work, but not anymore. You used to pray regularly and read your Bible faithfully, but not anymore. You used to teach Sunday school, but not anymore. And the reason that you don't is somewhere along the line, you got discouraged. You got discouraged about something. And in your discouragement, you said, I give up. I give up. I'm just not going to do it anymore. And I know sometimes people say, oh, pastor, you don't know the trouble. You don't know my troubles. You don't know my problems. I mean, and, and I hear people say, boy, if I just get through this time, I'll be all right. If I can just get... Past this trouble, I'll be okay. I've got news for you. You'll never be out of trouble. Boy, that's, that's real. That's encouraging, isn't it? But it's truthful. Job said this. Job said that man is a few days and full of trouble. That's just a fact of life. You know, I was reading in the Bible this week again about David over in 1 Samuel chapter 30. In fact, uh, turn back there with me. Would you do that? Uh, the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel all the way to the last chapter of 1 Samuel, which is chapter 30. Right there, there is 31. That's where Saul dies. So chapter 30, next to the last chapter. David is returning to Ziklag, which was his city. He has his men, his faithful men that have followed him. And he, verse number one says, it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You ever been there? You ever cried so long and so hard you just didn't have tears anymore? They had no more power to weep. They were exhausted in their grief. David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. Why, David? For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Ah, but here's the secret. David did what, church? Encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And he goes to inquire of the Lord and the Lord tells him what he should do to recover everything and to go after them and, and he does what God says. But I want you to back up a minute and think about David for a second. What do you think went through David's mind as he stood over the burned ruins of his home? At that time, 
not knowing whether anybody, his family, his wives, his children were dead or alive. God told us in verse 1, they did, they, in verse 2, they didn't kill anybody. They took them all away. But they didn't know that. Just, just, the, just thinking back over the last several years with David, He'd been anointed by Samuel. He said, if I'm, if I'm anointed to be king, if God is with me, then how come Saul's been trying to kill me? How come I've been running all over this hillside and in and out of the caves trying to hide from him? How come he's so jealous of me? If I'm the anointed of God and God's got his hand on me, why did I have to pretend like I'm a madman like I was insane to the Philistines so that they would let me go. Why, if God's Spirit's upon me, am I hiding in caves? Why do I have to, if I'm the anointed of God, why am I spending sleepless nights fearing for my life, living as an outcast? And finally I come home, the only home I have, and it's been burned up. It all is crumbled in an unbelievable disaster. And then to make matters worse, the ones who are closest to him, his his own associates, his own uh, 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 faithful men, talk about killing him. They're blaming him for the attack that they've gone through. Is this the way God treats his anointed servant? It's the way it appears on the surface, doesn't it? Where's, I wonder if he thought back to those days when he was the giant killer and all the people were saying Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. I wonder if in his mind's eye he could hear the people still admiring him and singing his praises, looking upon him with respect and love, but now he's in total rejection, a failure, and they're talking about killing him. Total despair. Total Failure. Total distress. Abandoned by God, feeling like he's abandoned by God and rejected by people who care about him. How how great it would have been to us as we look at this if there had just been one guy to come to him and say, David, it's going to be all right. Or put his arm around him and say, David, I'm for you, man. Your wives got taken too. Your children got taken too. It'll be okay. It's kind of like Moses. When You remember when he came down after the golden calf incident? And, and God was ready. He said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come here. And, and uh, the Levites and such came to his side. And then God basically said, you're going to j- just, just back off. I'm going to kill them all and start over. And you read Exodus 32, Moses intercedes for Israel. And he actually asks God to spare them. And if he has to blot somebody's name out of the book, he's asking God to blot my name out. And there's a line in the Bible there where it sort of just indicates Moses breaks down in tears willing to lay down his life for the life of Israel, for the people of Israel. And that's that's an amazing case of intercession. But you know what's amazing is later on, and by the way, God intervened, and and he he heard Moses' prayer, and he didn't kill all all the Israelites that day. But later on, Moses, in disobedience to God, smites the rock. Didn't didn't speak to it. Disobeyed God. And God said, okay, you're not going to enter the promised land. Joshua will take him in. You know what's sad about that story is? As far as we know, nobody of those two or three million Jews went to God on behalf of Moses and said, God, don't. He's He's been our leader. He's been our helper. He's been our example. God, I know it wasn't right, but please, please spare his life. There was nobody who came to encourage him. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? 
Sometimes uh, somebody just needs encouragement. Now, David didn't have anybody either. So David did the thing that you and I can do because there's times you're going to go through trouble, you're going to go through trials, you're going to be in distress, you're going to feel forsaken, and there'll be no one to turn to. And you'll have to do what David did. David, the Bible says, encouraged himself in the Lord. Because when no one else is around and nobody else seems to come to you and there's nobody to speak an encouraging word to you and everybody seems to move away from you, hey, there's one who said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is always there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's a very present help in time of trouble. In Back in 2 Corinthians, the passage we read this morning. The church at Corinth was a very troubled church. When you think about being to the church at Corinth, there's 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians. There's another 13 chapters of 2 Corinthians. That's 29 chapters to the one church. When you think about some of the other New Testament churches that Paul wrote to. When you wrote to the churches, plural of Galatia, there's only six chapters to address all that, all of them. The church at Ephesus, six chapters. The church at Philippi, four chapters. Church at Colossae, four chapters. So you have six and six and four and four, so that's only 20 chapters. You and that's that's at least four churches and multiple churches in the region of Galatia. And here's one church that he's got 29 chapters to. Why is that? They had a, it was a problem church. This is, the church of Corinth is not the church you'd want to pattern your church after. They had some big time problems. Divisions, lawsuits, carnality, false spiritual gifts, abusing the Lord's table, confusing uh, uh, confusion over the gospel and the resurrection of Christ. I'm sure as they read 1 Corinthians, they had to get discouraged. There's some pretty heavy rebuke going on. Some pretty heavy things that, that came upon them. And so they were discouraged. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where we read this morning, he says in verse number 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us. And the word comfort there is the same word that we get our word encouragement. And you could really say it's the God of all encouragement, who encourages us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to encourage them, which are in any, any trouble, by the encouragement wherewith we ourselves are encouraged of God. And so he's saying, hey, 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 church of Corinth, he is the God of all encouragement. And now I want to encourage you about some things. I've, I've rebuked you. I, I've straightened you out on some things. I've told you the truth. I know that's hurtful. I know it's discouraging. You needed to hear it. But now I want to encourage you. And he gives them some encouragement. And I'm glad. That when I get discouraged, I have a God that I can go to that is the God of all encouragement. I'm glad that when I, get, when I have troubles come, that I can get alone and seek the God who is the God of all encouragement. I'm glad that when the storms of life come and it tosses my boat around and I see the winds and I see the waves, that, that I have the God of all encouragement to be able to go to. I'm glad when days get difficult that I can tap into the plentiful, bountiful, unlimited resources of the God of all encouragement. He is the God of all encouragement. Now, troubles are not necessarily God's punishment. Troubles humble us. Troubles prove us. Troubles cause us to make corrections in our life. It's kind of like the Old Testament illustration where Jeremiah used the potter and the clay. He said, you're like the clay that's on the potter's wheel and he spins that wheel around and the, he's fashioning that clay into a vessel in order to do that by the way in order to do that he's got to be hands on in order to do that he's got to apply pressure to our lives and we have to be yielded just as the clay is yielded to the hands of the potter we have to be yielded to the hands of God in our life and allow him to be able to work in our life 
And so we realize that God uses the pressure, the trials, the troubles, the disappointments, the illnesses, the setbacks. He's using that to shape us and to mold us to be more like Christ. I want to give you several thoughts today and then I'll let you go home. Number one, I want us to recognize the source of trouble. Recognize the source of trouble. Would you hit that first rung on that fan right there for me, please? That's perfect. Thank you. Recognize the source of trouble. You know, we give Satan too much credit. We give Satan too much credit. Satan is not almighty. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Satan is not almighty. Satan is not omnipotent. That means he's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Okay? If, if Satan can't read your mind. He doesn't know your thoughts. Once you let him come out of your mouth, he knows your thoughts. So don't speak everything you think. He's not even omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once. God can be. But Satan cannot be. And so, I realize whenever anything happens to a child of God, there's only two possibilities. God directly acted and brought it about in my life. Or, God allows us or someone else to act to bring it about in my life. God either directly brought it into my life or He allowed me or someone else to bring about the trouble in my life. Those are the only two possibilities. You remember Job. God permitted Satan to act. Took away Job's wealth. Took away the, the, the cattle. Took away the sheep. Took away the camels. Took away his children. What did Job say? The Lord gave. And the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Alright, Satan said, well that didn't work. Let me touch his body. Let me take it skin for skin. You touch his health, he'll curse you to your face. And God gave him permission to touch his health. And Job was struck with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Miserable. In fact, it was so miserable, he, he cut a piece of pottery and he would just scrape it down his arm and scrape those boils and break them. You think, boy, that would hurt. That probably, that, that, it hurt so bad, that felt good to Job. But even after he did that and... And, and he was suffering and he had ashes and he's sitting in the ash heap. You know what he said? Hey, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job never sinned with his lips or charged God foolishly. See, God allows trouble. But then he'll give us what we need when we're in the trouble. God allowed the trouble, but then He'll give us the grace we need when we're facing the trouble. God will give us the trouble, and then He'll give us strength to go through the trouble. With the trouble comes the comfort. With the trouble comes the encouragement. So there's no reason to quit. There's no reason to stop. Remind yourself in the trouble, He is my God. Jesus is still my Savior. The Bible is still my book. The Spirit of God is still my helper and my encourager and my comforter. And I know that God works all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. The psalmist said it this way, This poor man cried, and the Lord delivered him out of all his troubles. All his troubles. So I recognize the source of my trouble. The second thing, I want to do and we should do is thank God for your troubles. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Do what? Yeah, thank God for your troubles. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Are troubles part of everything? Huh, yeah. So should I thank God for trouble? Yeah. I know, easy preaching, hard living. I understand. But James tells me, in fact, the book of James says, my brethren, count it all 
joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When your faith is tried and God brings you through trials, you're to count it all joy. So when the bottom drops out, just praise God anyhow. So when you're publicly embarrassed, just praise God anyhow. Okay? When, when disease enters your body, you just praise God anyhow. When the pink slip comes at work, you just praise God anyhow. Listen, listen, listen. The only person that can defeat you is you. The only person that can whip you is you. The only one who can make you quit is you. You're the only one. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What am I going to give thanks for? I'm giving thanks that He's shaping me and molding me into the image of Christ. So I can be thankful when the trouble comes. God, I know you're applying some pressure, but you're trying to make me, you're trying to shape me into a vessel of honor. You're trying to shape me to look more like Jesus. And for most of us, that takes a little bit of work. We know that. Number two, I thank Him because He's involved in my life. God is not a hands-off God. God's a hands-on God. He's involved in our lives. And He's at work actively molding us and shaping us. And the third reason I thank Him is that He desires to change me. You say, oh, God loves me just as I am. And He loves us just as we are. But He loves us too much to leave us the way we are. You come to Christ just as you are. But we sang this morning, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. When Christ takes up residence, you know what? Things begin to change. Things begin to change. When I was in Bible college, the church, were, it was a downtown church, and they bought up old buildings, and the Spanish ministry needed more room. And they purchased a building at the at a corner of two streets, and it was called the Seven Seas Lounge. It had been a bar. And, and for the, listen, it was announced, we purchased the building, and now we own it, and it's ours, and we're going to be changing it into the Spanish auditorium. But for the next several weeks, two, three weeks, it still had Seven Seas Lounge up there. Still had the old bar stools in there and the bar was still inside the building. Now, let me ask you a question. Had it changed ownership? Yeah. Someone else owned it? Absolutely. Had any changes come about yet? No, but they started. Pretty soon the sign came down. Pretty soon the chairs came out. Pretty soon the, 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 the flooring came out. Carpeting came in. Platform was built. Pulpit was put in. Chairs came in. And all of a sudden you look in and it's a Spanish department and, and, and you look in and there's preaching going on and singing going on and songbooks going on. Hey, and you say, wait a minute. I can imagine somebody who hadn't been there for a couple of years come back. Hey, let's go back to that Seven Seas Lounge. That was, a, that was some place to go, wasn't it? And they walk down there and say, whoa, what happened here? This ain't the same place I remember. What happened? It changed. What changed it? Listen, it got a new owner. And when God becomes your owner, He begins to change you so you won't live for your purpose anymore. You live for His purposes. And He changes you in your life. And God loves us too much to leave us the way we are. So I want to recognize the source of my trouble. I want to thank God for my trouble. And then number three, keep on serving God in spite of your trouble. Keep on serving God anyway. You have your Bible there. Uh, you're in 2 Corinthians 1. Just go to your right a little bit to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is going to give us a little bit of an account. The only time he ever does this. He, he peels back the curtain a little bit to show us what he went through in ministry for Christ. He says in verse number 23 of 2 Corinthians 11, did you notice? He says, are they ministers of Christ? Now here's a parenthesis here, I speak as a fool. 
In, in other words, I, I wish I didn't have to say this. But I guess I'm, I'm, I guess I'm answering a fool according to his folly. And here's what he went through. Look what he says. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Hmm. Doesn't sound like Paul's book would be called Your Best Life Now. Does it? That's what he went through. And guess what he did? He kept on going. There are, there, are, there are many folks who go through far less than that and have thrown in the towel and said, I'm done. I quit. There are folks, there are folks, Brother Bob knows, that who, who no longer come to church because one individual wouldn't say hello to them. How come you're not coming to church anymore? Oh, I come there for two years. I can't get that person to say hello to me. That's, that's all it took. That's all it took to get you to say, I give up, I throw in the towel. Aren't you going to be a little embarrassed when you see Paul in heaven? And you recall what he's been through and many of the others that went before us? Well, you know, I missed for three weeks and the pastor never called me. So I quit going there. Really? That's all it took. If you stop, if you quit, if you throw in the towel, don't you blame troubles. Don't you blame discouragement. Don't you blame critics. Don't you blame your circumstances. Don't you blame your health. You just get a mirror out, look straight in it and say, there's the one to blame. It's me. I'm the one. When you feel yourself discouragement coming on and everybody gets discouraged. And by the way, I, I, we, we close the radio every day with be good to everyone because everyone's having a tough time. So when you have an opportunity to give a word of encouragement to someone, give it to them. Everybody needs encouragement. But when nobody encourages you and you hear a discouraging word everywhere you go, hey, then, then you got to go and get away from everybody. Lock yourself in a room somewhere with just you and your Bible and God and say, I'm staying here till I get some help from the God of all encouragement. And I need to hear from God today. And let God encourage your heart. And You just tap into the God of all encouragement until you can walk out of that room and you just singing, everything's all right in my Father's house. In my Father's house. In my Father's house. Everything's all right in my Father's house. Where there's joy, joy, joy. Back when I was at Bible college, we had a dormitory at college that, that burned. And everybody was devastated. Had to move out hundreds of the girls' dormitory and replace them and pile them on top of other ones, you know, and it was a it was a it was a devastating thing. And I'll never forget the Pastor House coming into the uh, chapel that next day, and and he come into the pulpit, and everybody's quiet, listening. What what is he going to say to us about this fire? You know what he did? He stood in the pulpit and he said, "Everything's all right in my Father's house." In my Father's house, in my Father's house, everything's all right in my Father's house. 
Where there's joy, 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 everything's... And we sang that for 10 minutes. By the time we were done singing, we were kind of glad the place burnt down. <laughs> it was okay. Why? Everything's all right. And so just, just stay alone with God until God... Hey, He's the God of all encouragement. And He will encourage your heart. There's going to be times when no one's going to encourage you. And you're not going to have anybody to encourage you. So single parent, you better tap into the God of all encouragement. Hey, hey, mom and dad, you better tap into the God of all encouragement. Hey, senior saint, you better tap into the God of all encouragement. Life is trouble. And we're all prone to discouragement. But He is the God of all encouragement. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. The God of all encouragement. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I want you to take the truth now this morning. Lord, I pray that it has been a help. I pray it's been an encouragement to your people today. Thank you for being a God of all encouragement. We love you. We thank you so much for loving us. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what we go through, you've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, I pray you'd speak to the hearts of people today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. Then we'll have our invitation. But I wonder, how many folks here in the room this morning would say, Pastor, you talked about that wonderful change in your life that takes place when Jesus comes into your heart. There's a time in my life when I ask Christ to be my Savior. And I put my faith and trust in Him. And I would testify that that change has taken place in my life. I know that I'm saved. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. So somebody here this morning would say, Pastor, I, I, I can't say that there's ever been that change in my life. I, can, I don't know of a time when I personally asked Jesus to be my Savior. Would you let me pray for you? No one's going to call you out. No one will embarrass you at all. But I'll certainly pray for you. Because God's dealing with your heart. And I, and I will pray that you'll listen to him. Would you be here this morning and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that I've ever asked Jesus to be my Savior. But Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I could see it this morning? God bless you. Thank you. Is there somebody else today? You couldn't lift it other time, but you'll lift it this time. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I wonder how many believers here this morning would say, Preacher, I needed the message today that he's the God of all encouragement. And I pray that you would pray for me this morning. The Lord stopped and he really dealt with my heart today. And it's just what I needed to hear this morning. Pastor, pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you've never asked Him to give you the gift of eternal life and to change you, would you, when others are coming to pray, would you slip from your seat, just come down to the front, I'll meet you. We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. How you can be certain you have eternal life and you're on your way to heaven when you die. Christian, you just want to come and bow the knee and say, God, you're the God of all encouragement and I sure could use some. And ask God to give you the encouragement you're seeking. He's a good God. He does good things. He'll encourage you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. I would pray, Lord, your will be done in every heart and life. I pray, Lord, for these in the room who could not lift their hand to say they were certain that they knew they were saved or they knew they were on the way to heaven. That they would slip from their seat when others come to pray and say, I'd like someone to show me how I could know I have eternal life. 
Lord, I pray that those in this room who are saved and you spoke to their heart, they just need to respond, bow their knee, and spend some time with their God this morning. I pray you'd hear their prayer. Put your arms around them. Encourage them this morning. But have your way in every heart and life during this invitation, please. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet, if you would, please. As you stand, the pianist is going to play. As she plays her invitation hymn this morning, God has spoken to your heart. You, you respond to him. That's right. <coughs> That's right. this way for just a minute <clears throat> I read this week and some of you aren't hopefully you'll, so you'll, you'll still understand the lesson even though you may not be a football person years ago the famous coach for the Green Bay Packers named Vince Lombardi have you heard of Vince Lombardi quite a few of you have and uh, he one particular guard on his team was having a pretty bad practice just a rookie. And Lombardi pulled him aside and just told him what a lousy football player he was. You're not blocking anybody. You're not hitting anybody. You're a sorry excuse for a football player. Well, I don't know what's going on with you, but just get off my field and get out of here. He sent him to the locker room. He said it was over an hour later when practice was done. He came into the locker room and that giant man was still sitting in his locker fully dressed in all his pads, sobbing, just weeping. And that's when Vince Lombardi went over to him and put his arms on his shoulders and he said, son, I guess I should have told you the rest of it. He said, inside of you is a great football player. Inside of you is a guy who can block and tackle and run and 
that's tough and can, can handle it. That's the guy. And if you'll stay with me, I'll help bring that guy out. And so Jerry Kramer stayed with him. And Jerry Kramer became an all-pro guard. He's in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Because of encouragement. Because of encouragement. It's so much easier to tear things down than it is to build things up. A lot, lot, lot more work goes into building up, but everybody can use encouragement. Amen? So realize when God wants to encourage someone, He may be using you to do it. And so, be an encourager. All right? Now, let me, let me reverse that just for a second and remind you that if somebody... And people will say things to you that are not encouraging. You won't get through life without that. <clears throat> but I am not going to let you determine my disposition. No, but no one else can make me have a bad day. Okay? People say that all the time. What, what's our favorite expression? Have a good day. Well, thanks for the sentiments, but you won't determine that. I will. Amen? Amen. Uh, Little, little song I learned years ago. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm blue. My disposition depends on you. No, it doesn't. My disposition is going to depend on me. And it's going to depend on my relationship with God. When everything's all right where it's supposed to be, nothing you can do to change that. Okay? And so you be that encouragement, and you can't let anyone else discourage you. Amen? That's sermon number two, no charge. Don't, don't have any extra for that, all right? Thanks for listening this morning. Good to see you here in church. Let's uh, pray together, sing our song of dismissal, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here this evening at 6.30. Father, thank you for a wonderful morning this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you, Lord, for people who come to hear the word of God. They desire to hear, thus saith the Lord. But Lord, I, I pray that you'll dismiss us with your care. Give each of us a good afternoon. Prepare our hearts what you have for us this evening. And we'll thank you for it. I do pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. We're going to sing this, then just hold for about 10 seconds, and I'm going to get to the back, okay? All right, ready? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood join tears with jesus as we travel this side for i'm a part of the family the family of god all right 10 seconds here we go